morning, everyone. Uh, so we've reached the end of our first uh, chapter in Chem 12. Uh, this one here has been a chapter on reaction kinetics. Uh, I was hoping just to summarize uh, some of the main uh, themes that we learned in this chapter here, uh, see if there was any questions I can uh, answer all at once here. We'll practice through a few problems in sort of preparation for our test. So uh, starting off here with unit number one, our main concept here was to look at a chemical rate. And essentially, we were saying a rate is going to be measuring some change in amount versus change in time, right? So a rate, uh, if you were going to define a rate here, uh, this is basically the speed at which uh, you can mention uh, products are formed or reactants are consumed, right? So I have a just sort of general idea here. Uh, reactants on the left side, products on the right side here. The speed at which the product concentration goes up, right, I'm making products or my reactants goes down, that's referred to as the rate. Um, a couple ways I can find rate here. Uh, for the amount here, we actually saw that we can actually measure a few different uh, variables. We saw experiments where you can actually change mass. Uh, you can change pressure and volume. When you do with pressure and volume, we are specifically looking at gases. These ones here are inversely related. So they're opposite of each other. Uh, if you're sort of getting confused, oh, what does this pressure mean here? Think of it in terms of volume, but it's just sort of the opposite. So those ones are specifically for pressure and volume, uh, especially if the reaction is endo or exothermic here. We can track how quickly uh, the temperature itself changes continuously. Is it getting hotter? Is it getting colder? To actually find the temperature. Concentration is a little bit tricky. I don't have meters that can detect concentration of every possible chemical you can think of, but there are a couple of different ways of doing concentration. For example, if I was dealing with H+, if I was dealing with the acidity, we do actually have what's referred to as a pH meter. Just want to reiterate this here. Remember pH, we're going to actually see the math of this in a later chapter. We're going to usually use 7 as a dividing line, neutral for uh, 25 degrees. pH, although it looks at H+, pH is just the name of this ruler here. We have, when I get down to pH of 0, we have the more acidic side. When I get up to 14, we have the more basic side here. Let's say, for argument's sake here, my reaction actually loses H+. If I steadily go from a pH of 2 to 3 to 4, I'm actually getting less acidic. What happens to pH as I get less acidic? Well, on this ruler, right, from the 0 to 7, my number is actually getting larger. I would actually call less acidic. I'd actually refer to that as actually pH increases. I get a very commonly um, a misinterpretation here. They say, oh, pH is an acid scale, and if acid scale is increasing, we're more acidic. Well, no, it's actually saying the number on the scale is actually getting bigger, and it's actually getting bigger. It's getting farther and farther away from the acid again, and that actually is coincidental with less acidic. It's getting closer to neutral, even potentially getting to be more basic. Uh, other uh, concentrations that we've been able to see here, sometimes we have something that's colored. So let's say we said copper 2 plus is actually colored, it's actually blue in solution. We can use what's called a spectra, uh, spectrophotometer. Uh, if I can scan uh, the absorbance uh, as if I generate more copper, it gets more deep blue color. If the copper is getting used up, it gets less and less blue. I can do that to find concentration. I can even sort of do a titration, although the problem with doing a titration here is it takes time to do a titration. So we can't like, oh, let's let the reaction go and then at 5 seconds, do a really quick titration. At 10 seconds, do a quick titration. It doesn't work like that. What you would need to do is something like you let the reaction go for about a minute. You have to stop the reaction. You can take all the time you need in titration. You let the reaction go for two minutes. You need to stop the reaction. You can do a titration. There are ways of doing that, but it's just a little bit more challenging than some of these other properties that we had so far. Right? Uh, careful for the systems. We've been talking about your system can either be referred to as an open system or a closed system. An open system is one in which matter can escape. So especially if I have one gas that's leaving, I know that the mass changes because of uh, this gas here. I might want to do a closed system for like pressure and volume kind of conditions here. If I have one gas that's being uh, produced, I either want it to fill up a balloon, I want to sense the size of the balloon changing over time, or maybe hook up a pressure sensor as the gases hit my pressure sensors a little bit harder. That's actually going to amount to an increase in pressure. All of those are physical characteristics that you can monitor to actually determine the rate. The bottom part doesn't change, however. The bottom part is always, it's called a time rate of change. This bottom unit has to be a unit of time. Seconds, grams, minutes, sorry, not grams, uh, seconds, minutes, years, uh, some 
order of rate there. Right? So let me just give you a quick thought experiment here. I want to just show you that graph once more. So we started off, uh, we looked at this reaction, start off with zinc solid and react with 2HCl. This is an aqueous. This is going to become um, Z and CO2. You can check your solubility chart, that's aqueous. Hydrogen, when it's by itself, is um, diatomic and it's gaseous. So all we have here is we have our container. I would probably leave this in an open container. I drop my piece of zinc inside. The hydrochloric acid will very quickly collide with it and try to react with it here. I'm going to start seeing bubbles. Those bubbles are actually hydrogen. It's great. I'm only getting one gaseous release. It's not impossible to have a change in mass if even more gas is released, but remember, we wanted to have the rate that was specific for one chemical so that we can do our stoichiometry, we can re-express that number in terms of the other chemicals. So in this case here, I'm going to stick the whole thing on a balance here. Uh, let me give you a few just starting numbers here. Uh, let's say at zero seconds, let's say everything all together is 100 grams. Uh, let's say at five seconds of time, this one has dropped to um, 81 grams. Let's say at 10 seconds of time, this one has dropped to uh, 65 grams, and at 15 seconds, it's dropped to 60 grams. All right. So we know that we're in an open system. We know the reason why the total mass, I thought mass is supposed to be conserved. The reason why my total system is actually uh, decreasing in mass is because as those bubbles of hydrogen actually get released, those gases end up actually escaping. This method of doing sort of open system and measuring mass change usually works for slightly heavier gases. So this is slightly theoretical here, but you get the idea because I've taken down a few readings, mass against uh, the uh, time, we can actually plot mass, make sure you label your axis here, mass is in grams. We have our time axis here, time is in seconds. I only took a few readings at a couple intervals. Usually uh, even time intervals make it a little bit easier to read. So. At zero seconds, I'm going to find where it says 100. So maybe that's where it says 100. I notice my values don't get anywhere lower than 60. Maybe I'm going to break the graph. So between zero and 60, uh, actually even let's just do zero and 50. So that I can scale this maybe a little bit easier here. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, right? Something like that. Maybe I'll move up the 100 a little bit, right? You can break the graph as long as there's no data uh, in between that segment that's broken. So. Graphically, this is what you would imagine. I'm going to take the math. Uh, I'm going to take the time. Time is the x-axis here. I'm going to take the time of zero seconds, and I'm going to plot it against a total mass of 100. So 0, 100, that's my first point. I have 5, 81, so maybe about there. Uh, 10, 65, uh, maybe about there. And then 15 and 60, uh, right there. Right. So graphically, that's what we've done. We've only taken this reading here four times. What a graph does is it sort of tracks the best fit line. It sort of tracks the, what about the in-between? What about if I was three seconds in? Uh, I would imagine that the graph is very gradual. So see if you can just eyeball the graph. When you eyeball this best fit line here, it may be different from the person next to you. It may not necessarily go through every single point because of those random errors. Sometimes it's on the high side, sometimes it's on the low side. But again, it gives you some approximate value. What I want to just sort of reintroduce to you here is uh, how we can analyze this graph. First question here is, why does it look like this graph here steadily is leveling off? Right? It may not level off exactly at 60. Maybe if I had 20 seconds, maybe it's like 58 or something like that. But eventually it will level. This mass here, the, where it's leveling, remember I'm measuring the total mass of system. So even though uh, my uh, mass is dropping, the only reason why it's dropping is because of hydrogen. I know any amount, so this 19 grams here was actually because it's loss due to hydrogen. Um, but we still have the container, we still have the water, we still have the particles dissolved in here. It won't eventually drop to zero. Don't wait for it to drop to zero. What we're interested in is more so the change. Again, that change is specifically due to one chemical. Um, and what you can do graphically is you can actually measure two different rates. Uh, let's say I was asked to calculate Calculate the average rate of consumption. Don't worry about words like consumption or production. Consumption usually just specifies, oh, it's actually a reactant that we're actually using up. If it's a product, I would usually just say production, right? So calculate average rate, uh, and I'm going to specify two times because I sampled it here between 0 and 15 seconds. So I'm going to put a point at 0. I'm going to put a point at 15. And I know, realistically, the speed actually changed. At first, it was actually a little bit steeper. A little bit later, it's getting more and more shallow. It's more and more flattening. 
the rate is not constant over these 15 seconds. But what average rate does is it says, I want you to average over, yeah, sometimes we're fast, sometimes we're slow. If I want to get this amount of mass change, this difference in mass, and I only have 15 seconds to do it, what average rate would I have to have fallen at? On average, every second, how much grams would I have to have lost for hydrogen so that I can get to that very same point? So in that case there, for average, you always have two points. You have the zero seconds, you have the 15 seconds here. What you're gonna do is you're gonna find the slope of the secant. And the secant line is basically this, connect the dots here to find the slope. You just pick two coordinates, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. And in this case here, it's very simple because you do have both points. So I have the coordinates here, I'll do this for you. 15, 15 was matched up at 60. It's possible my best may be a little bit lower than 60, that's fine. I have 0 and 100. I'm going to try this y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. So let's go 60 minus 100. I lost 40 grams. It took you 15 seconds to do that. 40 divided by 15, uh, this gives you 2.7 or so. 60 minus 100 divided by 15, uh, yeah, 2.7. Oh, this one here actually happens to be a negative. Don't get scared away by this negative here. This would be in units, grams per second, because the rise of a run, the rise is grams, the run is seconds. What does that negative mean? Oh, that negative just means mass that's lost, so that means it's consumed. So in words, you can actually say the consumption rate is actually positive, 2.7, and you can just say in words, that's consumed, that's eaten away. So mathematically, it might come out as a negative. You can just restate it as a positive here. So realistically, uh, the mass actually changed different from this. At first, it was really fast. A little bit later, it actually starts slowing down. But on average, if I lose 2.7 grams for every second, over 15 seconds, I would have lost enough mass to get you to that very same point. It's a little bit more interesting a story if I, they asked you, uh, calculate what's called the instantaneous rate. So let's say that's part A. Part B, I want you to determine or find the instantaneous rate. So don't get scared by that word here. It's just the rate at a given instant, right? Instant, I realized I spelled it wrong. Instantaneous rate. Find me the speed at one particular instant. It could totally be at zero seconds. It doesn't have to be. So in this case here, just to show you here, I want the instantaneous rate at um, eight seconds, right? At first, you're going to be like, well, I didn't take a point at eight. Well, that's why graphically here, I sort of plotted that point here. So at eight seconds, it looks like we're about here. Right? Only problem for instantaneous rate, unlike average, which gives you two times, where you can just sort of pick two coordinates here. This one here, I only have one time. I might still be able to read that coordinate. If I had a grid paper here, I could read it a little bit better. I have the coordinate, let's say, 8, comma uh, 70. But I only have one point. I can't find the slope. The slope in general is supposed to be the rate. How do I find the slope of a single point? This time, what you're going to do is you're actually going to find the slope of the tangent. And your tangent might be different from the person next to you, but essentially what the tangent is, is you're going to zoom in on this slope here. You're going to find where this curve is. I'm going to zoom in over here. You're going to find this curve. You're going to try to draw a straight line fit that touches the point exactly at 8 seconds so that hopefully my straight line, I mean, it's not a very good tangent, I'm hoping that my straight line, my blue line here, if I zoom in really, really close, my purple line essentially follows the blue line. And what's going to happen uh, by doing that tangent here, you would have basically have set a, some constant slope. Again, use a ruler for this one here. It's easier if you actually have graph paper. So you just plot that tangent line here. I'm hoping really close in, the curve overlaps with this. And then what you can do is you can take any two points that are really easy to read on the tangent. Because the tangent now has a constant slope here, uh, you can um, pick any two points. Sure, I may have had the point here, uh, 8 and 70, if this was a good tangent here, I might read, oh, it looks like it's going through 0, maybe, I don't know, 92 or so. So let's plot this point here, I don't know, 0, 92. I've created that point here. That's another point on my tangent. Notice it's a point, sure, it's far away from the curve, no problem. But at least tangent, when you do the rise over run, it's just going to give you the slope. So again, one more practice here. Rise over run, 92 minus 70 divided by 0 minus 8. This gives you here 22 uh, divided by negative 8 here. 22 divided by 8. Again, it's negative, and coincidentally here, uh, I'm just going to say 2.75, just to show you that it might be different from the average, but looking at these lengths here, these lengths look very similar.
If I had chosen any other point, if I had chosen like three seconds, that slant there would definitely be steeper. If I had chosen some time later, that slant would definitely be a little bit uh, less. In this case here, I chose sort of a moderate here. You sort of see that this tangent here is parallel to that secant line. So coincidentally, these are very similar. Make sure you have units. Don't worry about the negative. The negative just means consumption. And because I have this right here expressed in terms of one particular chemical, we can do our stoichiometry. Let me just rehash for you the uh, balance equation here. Let's see if we can rewrite this in terms of, um, we have 2.75 grams per second. That's the instantaneous rate at eight seconds. If I want you to just to re-express this rate, tell me this number, but tell me relative to a different chemical, you're just gonna do some stoichiometry. So I want you to calculate for me, what would this rate be? If I want you to re-express the rate uh, as um, consumption of HCl in moles per minute. Although that question looks a little bit scary, all you're gonna do is just um, unit conversions. So I want moles of HCl divided by minutes. Start off with the unit given, 2.75 grams for a given second. Uh, because it's in grams, I can't use a mole ratio just yet. Molar mass is going to be 2 grams for a given mole. My mole ratio says for every one part hydrogen, there's a 2 in front of HCl. And then we're going to go, uh, that's already moles of HCl. I'll be lazy here. Moles of HCl. And then we're going to go, well, we have 60 seconds in a minute. Numbers on top you multiply, on the bottom you divide. 2.75 times 2 times 60, divide 2 again, I'm getting 165. I haven't changed the rate, but if you give me a whole minute of time and you're now talking specifically about a different chemical, HCl, uh, I actually have that number re-expressed for my new chemical. Okay? So that was a little bit of sort of math work here. How do we actually measure the rate? Uh, the next part was looking at what does the rate actually depend on? So that's the whole notion of collision theory. Remember for a successful collision, for reactions to occur, I'm just going to use RxM for short. For reactions to occur, uh, we need we need a successful collision. And it always comes down to these two things. If you can take away those two, um, you'll be fine for this chapter here. The two requirements for su successful collision is you need to have sufficient energy. There's always an energy requirement. You have to overcome some energy barrier, and you need to have favorable geometry. The angle of hit has to come in nicely. The angles need to be close enough together so you can break certain bonds and form certain bonds here. So at this point here, what we started doing is we started looking at two different types of graphs. One type of graph was a potential energy graph versus you could say time, I prefer reaction. So therefore, early on it's reactants, later on it's products. It would be a forward arrow if you're going left to right. It would be a reverse reaction, products to reactants like that. Let's say I start off here with an endothermic reaction. I start off with reactants, I end off with products. So far in grade 11, we've been doing, well, this is the delta H. Oh, delta H here is positive. I know this is endo. I know this one here is going to cool down the surroundings. What we actually end up seeing is the particles have to collide. Whenever particles are on a collision course here, the first things that see each other are the electrons. They repel away. It's not like these particles can stop dead in their track. They already had a lot of um, velocity going into it. That repulsion, however, is going to cause particles to slow down. As you slow down, you're going to end up trading in some of your kinetic energy. The energy has to go somewhere. You're going to start picking up potential energy. Two things can happen. More often than not, the collisions, the particles were already traveling too slowly. So by the time they trade in all their kinetic, they've only, we're actually going to have an activation barrier. They've only gotten part way up the hill. They've already collided. They haven't reached the minimum energy that they need, and they're just going to uh, bounce off each other. They're going to start speeding away from each other. They want to get uh, as far away from each other as possible. They're going to trade that potential back into kinetic energy. So that, so far, I said is an unsuccessful collision. It only gets part way up the hill. It doesn't quite make it up this. When we have this sufficient energy argument here, what I'm labeling is you plot the reactant line over. You plot an arrow to the top of the hill and we call that arrow there, this one here is the activation energy. Careful when you're asked to define this one here, activation energy, this energy barrier. You have to mention the terms minimum energy. It's the minimum energy needed 
sure for a successful collision, but they specifically want you to use the term needed to form the activated complex. And if you remember here, the activated complex is a really transient species here. It's at the really top here. If I just define activated complex for you here, the activated complex, uh, the activated complex is very high energy. The higher the energy, the less stable it is, so very, very unstable. This is a temporary species. You can't actually isolate it. You can't actually collect a sample of this. It's temporary because um, it's in process of rearranging bonds. Some bonds are breaking, some bonds are forming. Right? And in fact, depending on which bonds are trying to form, it's going to actually have a bigger arrow or not as big an arrow. Uh, in this case here, it's in the process of rearranging bonds. Uh, some are breaking while others are forming. So that's what it takes to be activated complex. That's sometimes referred to as a transition state. And there we actually use square brackets and then we use a sort of hash symbol. That means transition state. Basically, all the particles have to be present so that they can actually start switching bonds. Uh, just take this hint here. If the EA is big, a big activation barrier means a slow reaction because not a lot of particles actually have enough energy to actually get over that hill there. Um, how do we sort of study that a little bit more detail here? We can actually use our kinetic energy distribution. This is the other graph that they might ask you for. Uh, sorry, kinetic energy distribution. We're plotting the number of particles against their kinetic energy. We're plotting how many particles are traveling at a given speed here. Let's pretend I have a container full here. Although my temperature gives me the average energy, you will undoubtedly have some that are fast, some that are slow, most of them are sort of a moderate pace. So our, this is called the Boltzmann distribution. Our curve will always look something like this. There is always a minimum energy requirement that you at least have to have to react. So there is an energy barrier here. Pretty much say to yourself, the EA never changes. The only times this changes, uh, EA basically never changes. You can change temperature, you can change concentration, change surface area, catalyst, doesn't change anything. Never changes, except the two conditions that we see it did change. One is if you change, if we go from good geometry to bad geometry, bad geometry would be sort of like, well, the particles, when they were on a collision course here, they actually aren't close together where they need to actually reattach. I may need to actually have extra energy to twist the molecule here. That added energy would actually make this curve here even harder than it was before. That's one time the activation energy changes. The other time here, we always assume good geometry. So whenever they draw these curves here, this is for best case scenario. They don't do the bad geometry case. The other case here is using a catalyst. We sort of cheat a little bit here uh, while I have it on the board here. For a catalyst, how do catalysts work? They provide a alternate mechanism. They provide a different pathway to get from start to finish with a lower activation barrier. They make it easier to actually get over. So it used to be only these particles were fast enough, over the, only those could actually surmount uh, this uh, activation energy. If the catalyst ends up breaking this up, let's say into two steps, let's just redraw a graph here. So potential energy against time or against reaction. Uh, let's do an exothermic reaction. Maybe this one here, this EA was uh, the uncatalyzed pathway. So without catalyst, that EA was too big, the reaction is too slow. Maybe my catalyst actually takes us on a three-step pathway. Every pathway by itself has its own activation barrier. But you see these arrows here are nowhere near as big as what it was earlier. This is now the EA of the catalyzed pathway. I've now made the reaction easier, and I basically lowered this barrier here. That's the only time the EA changes. You can change temperature. You can change surface area. It doesn't affect it. But now that the barrier is actually a little bit lower, I again have more particles that can collide. So with that, I just want to finish off uh, just recapping. Um, bec based on this collision theory, we need this energy argument. We need this good geometry. What were some general factors you can play around with to speed things up and slow things down? We started off looking at temperature. For temperature, we actually are changing uh, the number of particles we have that have enough energy. Uh, temperature, in general, increasing temperature, you can say it increases the rate. Uh, you can say... Um, Basically, it speeds up, or you can say it's actually less reaction time. 
right? Because rate was something divided by time. The bigger the denominator, the bigger the rate is going to be. In this case here, we're looking at our curve. We actually change the number of particles. We start off with a curve that looks like this. At a hotter temperature, we just happen to have more particles that can actually travel fast enough. So our reasoning there, at higher temperature, we have more particles with enough energy. So that's the energy argument. When we looked at the other factors, looking at concentration, looking at surface area, right? these ones here, um, you can even think of a concentration as an increase in pressure, decrease in volume for gases. Right? If I shrink the size of the container, the concentration has gone up. In general, when you increase the concentration, the rate also goes up. Concentration doesn't affect the energy argument. Concentration, imagine going from a big container, maybe I have five particles in a big container, and I'm now in a smaller container. All you're going to see is the concentration has gone up. You could have also increased the concentration by adding more particles or by taking a chunk of solid. We call that a chunk when it's sort of all hidden away here. Some of the internal particles are actually hidden. Uh, we call it a powder if I just sort of dust it off and I expose more particles. In all of these cases, not only does the activation barrier doesn't change, this Boltzmann distribution relatively doesn't change as well. What's actually happening is more so the geometry argument. We just say in a higher concentration case, we have more collisions. It's not just the sheer number of collisions, though, but you need to end it off here. More collisions, so we have a better chance of a good geometry, a favorable geometry collision. And that's why uh, the reaction is actually faster. As we deal with this reaction kinetic stuff here, there's a relative order for rates. We would expect solids to be fairly slow. Then we have liquids. Then we have gases afterwards. Surprisingly, we actually have aqueous on top. Aqueous actually has the charges that can actually interact. That can actually force positive to go to negative. That can actually have a little bit of control over how the collisions occur. But what's important for you to realize here is the rate. It only depends on your reactants. So I can be like A and 2B. I can make 3C as a solid. I wouldn't look at this solid and say slow. The rate only depends on the reactant side. So if A is, let's say, an aqueous and B is a gas and you have nothing else to go on, the rate only depends on the reactants. Right? Evidently, it's the forward reaction um, that's going left to right here. Lastly here, I sort of touched on it already here, is this whole notion of a mechanism. A mechanism is that actual sequence of steps, the actual pathway to actually get from start to finish. Uh, I'm going to do a reaction with you here. Uh, let's do, we have a chlorine radical. It's going to react with hydrogen. This is going to become HCl and then a hydrogen radical. We're told that reaction is slow. That's step one. And then we have step two. Step two takes that hydrogen radical here, reacts with another chlorine, and ends up forming HCl and a chloride radical. First question they're going to ask you is if that's the proposed sequence of steps, what's the overall uh, what's the overall reaction? What's the overall task that we've accomplished? And all that entails here is put these guys here are reactants in their own individual steps, but all those guys go on the left. These ones here are on the right side. They all go on the right side. Anything that uh, cancels out doesn't appear overall. So something like H radical, it got created in the first step and used up another that canceled out. We call that an intermediate. So I'm just going to remind you here, an intermediate, it forms early and consumed later. It does not have to be the step right after. It could be in step 10, the hydrogen radical is still called the intermediate. It disappears. The chloride here also cancels out, but for a different reason. The chloride is initially put in. This one here gets canceled out. By the time you get to the end, this chloride cancels out this chloride here. It also doesn't appear, but it wasn't created. It was purposely added in. We call that one there a catalyst. Like I mentioned, a catalyst provide an alternate pathway. The pathway is a little bit less energy, so easier to get from start to finish. So a catalyst here is it enters early. It's something that we add to it. If I didn't add it, it wouldn't be present. Enters early and regenerated uh, later. Again, doesn't have to be the last step. So chloride is an example of this one here, whereas hydrogen is an example of radical. Those are that canceled out. So overall, this mechanism is H2 finds Cl2 becomes 2HCl. Sure, we produce one HCl in the first step and an HCl in the second step here, 
the deadly thing about this particular mechanism here is you see that when the chloride catalysts are not consumed overall, catalysts are not consumed overall, but this is what's referred to as a chain reaction. Now that the chloride is out again, it can then destroy another hydrogen here. So it actually chains, so it actually it's a product of one step here and actually re-enters the solution again and again. Right? Uh, so not used up overall. Uh, each of these steps here have their own activation energy. The slow step is referred to as the rate determining step. This is the step that actually controls the overall rate. And we would imagine the rate determining step is the one that has the biggest or the highest EA. This is the one with the biggest barrier. This is the one that's hardest to get over. If you could somehow speed up this rate here, the overall production would be sped up. For the catalyst, because I know the catalyst is chloride here, usually you put the catalyst up here just to say that's something I purposely put in to get the reaction going, hopefully with the reduced activation energy, hopefully faster than before. Right? So keep practicing your way through the worksheet here. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, guys.